Amen and amen. Let's give God a hand. Amen. Wow, thank you guys for being here today. If you got your Bibles, open up to Philippians in chapter uh, 4, and we'll get there in just a second. We've got to give it up for Danny sporting the Canadian tuxedo today. I love that. Denim on denim on denim, and it looks awesome. We appreciate that. Uh, but uh, you didn't know that was coming, did you? No, oh, he knew it was coming. Yeah, okay. So, uh, man, we're glad y'all are here with us. And, uh, man, last Sunday of the year. And uh, for many that want to take a break, man, we're here. And I'm grateful that we're here today and uh, grateful that you're here as well. And uh, I, I've been thinking about this question uh, for us, and I think it's appropriate to ask, what do we desire in 2019? Like, what do you desire from 2019? More of God, me too, uh, me too. I, there's so many desires that we might have. And honestly, not all desires are bad. I think when we say desire, there's this knee-jerk reaction to think that desire is negative. Uh, but not all desire is bad. Sometimes desire is neutral. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's not so good. But we all desire things. Uh, after a really good meal, I desire ice cream. I don't know about you, but I, I like ice cream after a good meal. Uh, I desire for my kids to listen. Can I get a witness? I want my kids to listen. Uh, some of you, maybe you desire to pay off your debt. Uh, you desire a new job. Some of you desire a job. Uh, that you, maybe you desire uh, paying off the student loans. Uh, I don't know what it might be for you, but what I do know is that there's one desire, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're a, a young high school student or you're a senior adult, uh, whether you, um, it doesn't really matter what season of life you're in, there's one desire that every single person needs and desires much of, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. We all desire a little bit of peace in our life. Because you're going to face something in the coming year or you've faced something in this last year that you would look at and go, man, that was tough. Like that was a trying, difficult circumstance. And how in the world do we embrace this peace of God when we're in a struggle, we're in a difficult circumstance, when we're in the middle of a conflict? How do we do that? So let's get a little bit of context here. We're going to try to answer that question today. And I want to get a little bit of context in Philippians chapter 4. If you look at verse 2, uh, this kind of sets the stage for us. Paul's writing a letter to a church in Philippi. And um, it's a big deal when you get your name mentioned in the Bible. And there are these two ladies with some pretty weird names that get their name into the Bible. Listen to what, why they're in here. The Bible says in chapter 4 of Philippians verse 2, I entreat Yodia, not Yoda, but Yodia. I entreat Yodia and Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Now, if you want to be the cruelest parent on the face of the earth, you will name your daughter Yoda, uh, 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 Yoda uh, I'm messing it up now, and Syntyche. Give me a break. I mean, really? So these two ladies, there's, what's happened here is there is a conflict. Maybe they're arguing over each other's names. I have no idea. But they're arguing, and there's some strife. There's some tension in between these two ladies in this particular church. And Paul's writing a portion of this letter to talk to them about their struggle, to talk to them about their lack of peace in their relationship. And he goes on, to, he tells them to agree in the Lord. And then he says in verse 3, yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow co-workers whose names are in the book of life. So right here, Paul has encouraged peace in the middle of conflict between these two ladies. And uh, this is interesting to me uh, that what these two ladies are wrestling with is what we all understand, is that sometimes it's hard to get along with people. Amen? Amen. Sometimes it's just hard to get along in relationships. Sometimes uh, what you would hope would be harmony, what you would hope would be easy in your home over the holidays, uh, sometimes it's not harmonious at all. Sometimes it's difficult. And sometimes there's relational strife and there's circumstances that we face in the context of life that just isn't easy. And there's a struggle. There's a lack of peace. And Paul tells these two ladies, and by the way, you and me, to agree in the Lord. Um, to agree. Now, how do we actually agree in the Lord? Well, Paul wrote about it in Romans chapter 12. He actually says these words, live in harmony with one another in verse 16. Now, what I like about that phrase, live in harmony with one another, is that harmony, um, actually, if you break it down, it, if you just think practically, um, what is harmony? 
Well, harmony, there's a lead part. Uh, there's a soprano, there's a tenor, there's a bass, there's an alto, uh, there's a baritone. And what's interesting about harmony is that they all have their own individual bents, their own individual notes that they sing, but yet it works together. So it doesn't mean that har- harmony doesn't mean that we all have to sing the same thing at the exact same time in the same way. What harmony means is, hey, you got your role, I've got my role, you've got your role, and it comes together and it complements one another and it's actually beautiful. The sound of harmony is actually a beautiful, pleasing thing. And what Paul is saying is that in relational strife, he's calling you and he's calling me to live in harmony. You've got your part, I've got my part, she's got her part, but we come together and it blends. It doesn't contradict, but it blends together and it creates this harmonious effect in our relationships. A few verses later in verse 18 of Romans chapter 12, he says these words, if at all possible, as far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. Paul is encouraging us to have peace in the relational department of our lives with people. And as far as it depends upon you and as far as it depends upon me, that means that whether someone is receiving your peacefulness, if you will, Uh, it's really not dependent upon you if they receive what you're doing. It's all on you. If you're being discontented, if we're being um, deceitful, if we're being conniving, that's on us. So as far as it depends upon us, we are peace givers. We're peace givers. it, It doesn't matter if they receive it or not. We just give it. That's the baseline for agreeing in the Lord. It's living in harmony, owning your role, being who God's called you to be, but also as far as it depends upon you, as far as it depends upon me as individuals, we're working this thing out as much as we can. It's like trying to iron out wrinkles in your clothes. You're working that thing out. You're pushing harder. You're blowing that steam blaster as hard as you can. Nobody else is doing that. Your wife can't do it for you. You do it for you. And that's what Paul's saying, as far as it depends upon me, I'm going to do my part to bring peace in the middle of this situation. So this is the context that we get to answer the question, how do we receive the peace of God? I don't know what you walked through through the holiday season. I don't know what you're going to walk through in 2019. But what I do know is that many of us are going to run up against and meet things in our lives that are going to literally sock us in the jaw, put us on our backside, and take our breath away. There are things out there that's just going to happen to us and happen around us in our lives and in our families. Now, I don't know what it'll be, and I don't know the circumstances and all the ingredients to that in your life or in mine, but what I do know is that what I'm going to give us today, what God's Word is putting before us today, these are like little recipes. These are little ingredients to the recipe of how to be peaceful in the midst of a pretty trying and difficult circumstance that we all will face at one point or another in our lives. So the question then is, is how do we receive the peace of God? That's a great thing to write down. How do I receive the peace of God? And there are four things that we do. The first thing is rejoice always. Now I know that seems counterintuitive, but if you want to receive the peace of God, Paul is going to tell us, and he's gonna tell these two ladies that are in the middle of this relational conflict to rejoice in that particular moment, in that circumstance. Now, here's what's interesting is the struggle is so real in our lives. Wouldn't you agree? Like, life just has a tendency to be real. Life is unpredictable. Life isn't always easy. Not everybody helps with the laundry. Sometimes uh, the bills are piling up. Um, Sometimes your boss doesn't get it, and so he or she comes down on you. Uh, Maybe you lose your job. Relationships are difficult. Uh, The days are just tough. Have you ever been in that season before? Have you ever been in that moment? Have you ever felt the, the struggle and the toil, as one writer said, of life? And it's in those moments that it's hard to rejoice. When you get the diagnosis. When a loved one dies. When you do lose your job. When it's your turn in the furnace, so to speak. It's tough to rejoice. That's why it feels weird when James says, hey, count it all joy, my brothers, when you face various trials or many different trials of of different kinds like you're thinking how can I actually rejoice in that struggle how and why in the world would I even choose to do that see the struggle is super real 
But what we need to understand and what I've learned and what I continually need to learn is that our strength doesn't come from a positive attitude. Our strength doesn't come from, well, you know what? I'm just going to be joyful in this moment. I'm just going to choose joy. Like, you can't even choose joy in the middle of that struggle. Something supernatural has to happen in your life and in mine. You see, our strength doesn't come from our circumstance, but our strength, it comes from our Savior. It comes from Jesus Christ by the power of God. In Nehemiah, in chapter 8, the scripture says that he wrote these words uh, that I think are super powerful. In Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Where you get your strength from is not the joy in the season, not the joy in the circumstance. The joy that which you receive in the middle of the struggle is Jesus Christ alone. Resting in him. And in that moment, that produces a supernatural delight that's above your circumstance. The struggle is real, but our strength comes not from our perspective even in the struggle. It comes from literally Jesus and Jesus alone. And then Paul tells us that there is the right spirit in which we embrace rejoicing. There's a right way and a wrong way to do it. And he says it in verse 5. Well, look at verse 4. I I skipped that. I'm sorry. This is where I built the whole point off of. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And he goes on to verse 5, and he says, let your reasonableness, everybody say reasonableness. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. That word reasonableness, you should circle that in your Bible. If you don't have a copy of God's word, just jot it down. It actually means gentleness or graciousness. Let your gentleness or let your graciousness be known to everyone. So the right spirit, it, listen, the spirit of rejoicing will produce this graciousness in your life. It's this idea of when I'm walking through the struggle, it's this, only God knows the end. Only God knows this, and by God's grace, we're gonna get through this. God knows God's plan in the work and work in the plan. He's not operating off a contingency plan. God has got this thing in control. He is sovereign and I trust him. That is a spirit of rejoicing. And he's saying, let your reasonableness, let your graciousness to who God is be known to everyone. Why would he say that? Well, because if you're in a relational conflict between Yodia and Syntyche, and you're in a, a stri- there's a fracture in a relationship, there's a tension in your life, and if you choose to be gentle, if you choose to be gracious, that is a supernatural effect by the power of God on your life. You can't do that on your own, and neither can I. And that will cause you and me to lift our perspective and rejoice in the moment that we're walking through. So how do we receive the peace of God? We start with rejoicing always. Secondly, we request appreciatively. We request appreciatively. It flows from this. So when you know this, that when you walk through a circumstance that was unpredictable, that was like a left, uh, you know, a curveball out of left field or however you want to word that, whatever metaphor you choose. And what's interesting about that is how many of you would say when you got news that you weren't ready for, when you were walking through a circumstance that you were not ready for, uh, that it sent you to your knees? How many of you would say that was me? It sent you to God in prayer five of us this is awesome so we're going to learn a lot right now this will be great the rest of us are we're going to learn a bunch uh, because that's kind of sometimes the design of those experiences sometimes God is trying to do something in you um, before he can actually do something through you and he's doing something in those circumstances to mature you and to mature me and to grow us but what I've learned in my life through experience and through the word of God is that there are some um, things that steal my prayers there's some poison to my prayer. You know what the poison to your prayer life is when you're going through a struggle? Worry, anxiety. Worry and anxiety steal your prayers. They steal your attention, they steal your heart, they steal your mind, and they hijack our prayer life. Listen to what he says. It says uh, in verse six, do not be anxious. Is that pretty clear? I feel like it's pretty clear to me. Like, like I love it when Paul, Paul's a super direct guy, by the way. So it's like, do not be anxious. It's actually a command. Don't be anxious for anything. Like, don't, don't, don't be anxious about anything. 
And we, we understand what anxiousness is, and I don't want to minimize uh, what you might be struggling with if you have, you know, you've been clinically diagnosed with anxiety. I'm not making a statement on that, okay? By any, I am not. But what I am saying is that the Word of God says, don't be anxious. And what he's explaining is this idea of brooding. I don't know if there are any farmers in the house today. I know kind of a new thing is, you know, we had some neighbors at one point in our life where they had chickens, you know, and uh, when there's a hen in the hen house and she's sitting on her eggs, it's called brooding. And what she's doing is she's just nesting on top of those eggs and she's just sitting there and sitting there and sitting there until that egg does what? Hatches, until that egg cracks. And what brooding is in the sense of psychological brooding is what he's talking about. It's I'm sitting and I'm brooding and I'm stewing 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 and I'm I'm thinking and I'm processing and then I begin to worry and then what if this and what if that and what if this and you're sitting on that egg, the proverbial egg of your life, whatever that thing is, and we sit and we brood and we build this anxiety, we build this worry on top of said problem and we continue to do that until it cracks and the reality is is it never cracks. And Paul is encouraging us, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing is what he says. And this is, when we we allow our minds to spend, it, it really is a poisonous pattern that poisons our prayers. And it begs the question, what are you anxious about today? What is it that is, that you're brooding over, that you're sitting on and constantly owning your mind and your heart? I don't know what it might be, but we'll let this speak over your life, what Jesus said in Matthew 6. Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? To which the question, it, it, brew, it, it begs the answer, and it's a, it's a natural answer. It's not in the text, but it's that rhetorical question that Jesus asked, and the, really the answer is, I can't add any hour to my life. I can't, I can't, like, all that worry, all that brooding, all that anxiety, all that stress over that particular issue, whatever it is that's owning you, like the issues that own me, uh, me worrying, me sitting on it, me festering over it, none of that worry is doing anything in my life but stealing my joy that he's already commanded me to be joyful. So our anxiety Hear me, and I want to say this in grace and in love, okay? Our anxiety actually accomplishes nothing. I think for some of us, we feel like it will. But it it doesn't accomplish anything. So what's the antidote? That's the problem. What's anxiety's antidote? Jesus First one, Jesus is near. Paul tells us right here in verse five, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. It's the idea of Jesus being really, really close. And I love that. I love the idea that even in the midst of my most trying of circumstance, in the midst of my most pressure point, like, ah, that hurts. Ooh, that hurts. That's tough. In the most difficult of circumstances, Jesus is right there. He's right there with me. He's right there with you. He's right there with us. He's right there in the midst of our struggle. And I love what the writer of Psalm 145 says. He says, the Lord is near to all who call on him. And you know what Jesus brings to the, that moment? It goes on to say that um, it says that he, to all who call on him, yes, to all who call on him in truth. He brings truth to the anxious, worry-filled heart. He brings truth to the situation. And how much do we know that when truth comes into light, it changes your perspective and mine? Have you ever had that moment where you're super worried, filled with so much anxious thoughts, and then somebody goes, well, here's how it really is, and you're like, oh, yeah, it is that way. I never even thought of it. never saw it from that perspective. You got the truth of the situation? That's what truth does to a heart that is filled with, with worry and filled with anxiety. He is close to us. Like a, think of this, like a gardener uh, tilling the soil, pruning the bush. Pruning is difficult. Uh, on the, it feels hard, like he's cutting. Have you ever been pruned before in your life? Metaphorically, please. Where you feel like, man, I constantly am getting chipped away at. I feel like I'm constantly being uh, nipped here and nipped there and, and cut here and, 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 and pruned back here. And the reason that you are pruning is because God's cutting away the things that are inconsistent with him. And he's pruning so that health 
can happen, so that growth can happen. So if you're feeling singed, I'm feeling singed right now in this season of my life. I feel like God's pruning things in my heart right now. And I used to get mad about that, but I don't get mad about it now. I just embrace it. Why? Because, listen, it means that the gardener is very close to that which he is pruning. And he's very near. And why is he doing that? First Peter tells us why. He says this, 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. The Bible also says that he's near to the brokenhearted. If you're walking through a very difficult situation today, understand this, that the antidote to your worry, the antidote to your anxiety is that Jesus is right there with you in the midst of it with you because he cares for you. Because he cares. The second thing, that helps us with our anxiety is he wants you to talk to him. Talk to him. Look at verse six. Verse six says this, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by, here it is, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, letting your request be made known to God. That's that right there. That's the idea of requesting appreciatively. You gotta talk to him, y'all. What Jesus wants is as he's near, listen, let me, let me paraphrase it like this. Or let me give you an example. Have you ever been out, uh, maybe you're eating at a restaurant and you notice that there is a couple on a date and they're not saying a word to one another? Have you ever noticed that before? Honest moment in church, has that ever been you? It has, okay, great. Now, here's what's interesting about that. Now, what you know is if they're not talking, most likely they have kids so that they're just quiet and they just need some quiet. So cut them a little bit of slack if you see that. But the other side of it that I wonder, I often go to, they must have kids. That's my first response because they need quiet. The second thing that I go to is, I wonder why they're not talking though. Have they lost things to talk about? Have they lost interest in the nearness of one another? What Jesus wants for you and for me is not to just ride in the car with him, not to just be just near and in his presence. He wants to hear from your heart. That's why he says, prayer. Come to me in prayer. It's literally coming before the Lord with what's on your heart. It's communicating to him, God, this is what I'm going through and this is how I feel about this and this is what I know your word says about this situation, but I just don't get it. It's communicating to God in prayer. It's not just sitting there and saying, okay, God, whatever you wanna do. Like there's an element to that. Praying is talking and listening but you've got to communicate, you've got to experience relationship with him. And I've noticed in my life, there have been moments where I've had those like, like my face turns white and I get kind of panicky about some, something in life. And I've noticed that that diminishes the moment I start communicating to God through prayer. And then I wait and I listen and his peace washes over my life. It washes over that situation. He, call, he says, call out to him in prayer. He wants us to bring all of our concerns before him. And then he says, call out in supplication. I don't know the last time I've ever used that word. But supplication is a pretty important word. It, it's this idea of whatever is that front burner, the bubbling over, if you don't move the pot, it's gonna burn. Have you ever had that moment when you're cooking? And that's what it is. It's that front burner situation. It's the thing that's going on in your life that it constantly pops back up and it's just bubbling over. over the, it's the most important thing that you're walking through right now. And God wants you to throw it to him. God wants you to communicate that to him. And some of us would go, you know, I don't know if, uh, we don't say this, but we say it by our lack of prayer. I don't think God can handle it. God can handle anything you throw to him. Any question you have, he's never not heard. He can handle it. He can handle it. So supplicate is what I'm saying. Go before him and give him the front burner things in your life. And then notice this. Uh, well, by the way, I want to jot, th jot this thought down. Supplication is like praying like there's no tomorrow. Supplication is praying like there's no tomorrow. And what I've wondered in my life, and I don't know why it is this way, but I'm just a, a moment that I just need to be transparent with you. There are times where prayer is the first thing that falls off the table in my spiritual life. It's the first thing that falls off the table, man. Once you land where you, God wants you to be, once you start doing the things God wants you to do, uh, you prayed all the way up to that moment, right? 
And then as soon as you land into whatever that thing is, the relief happens, the, the kid gets married, the bills get paid, the whatever, whatever you prayed for and God shows up and answers that prayer, prayer is the first thing in my life that falls off the table. And I would imagine that that's probably the same for many of us in this room today. And I don't want to come, like God doesn't like smack me around with this thing, but he says, why is that, Aaron? Because when you pray to me, this is fellowship, this is relationship, this is communicating back and forth, man. Like you think you can do it all by yourself, Aaron? You cannot do it. I know you just got the answer, but you still need me here, 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 and here. You need me everywhere. Prayer, supplication, and the last thing he says, he calls us to pray with thanksgiving. To pray with thanksgiving. That's that sense of gratitude. It's that sense of God, we know you're gonna do something in the midst of this conflict. Do you imagine as Yodia and Syntyche, the context of this passage, as they heard Paul saying this, you're like, oh, so God's gonna restore this relationship. He could. And so we're praying to that end, that God, you're gonna do the miracle. We are thankful that you're already answering. You're already working this thing out. You're already moving in said direction. You're already making this thing happen. And we're grateful for who you are, what you've done, and what you're doing in the midst of this circumstance. It's a spirit of thankfulness. How often in my life have I perceived God as a spiritual vending machine where I go to him for A9 and he answers, I take it, I eat it, and I move on. And then I come back to him for a diet Dr. Pepper and then I come back to him for some peanut M&Ms and then I come back to him for those little random vending machine prayers. And listen, that's fine if I just started following Christ because I don't know any better but as I've followed Christ for nearly 30 years now that, that, that the vending machine prayer doesn't cut it in a true growing vibrant and active relationship with God and if I want the peace that surpasses all understanding vending machine prayers aren't going to necessarily deliver that it's these prayers that are white hot burdened God only you could move and I'm grateful for what you're going to do. And God, I lay this before you and I, I appreciate everything you're about to do. And give me the grace to understand even if it's not the way in which I think it should be. If you and I want the peace that surpasses all understanding in our lives, we gotta begin with rejoicing always. We move towards requesting appreciatively and then flows out of that this idea of reflect attentively it flows into this moment where we begin to reflect attentively and uh, instead of worry and anxiety dictating how we navigate through our difficulties uh, and through the unknown Paul urges these two gals in the church in Philippi to reflect on certain things what are those things that we're supposed to reflect on let's read the passage and then we'll point them out verse 8 the scripture says uh, finally brothers whatever is true whatever is honorable whatever is just whatever is pure whatever is lovely whatever is commendable if there is any excellence if there is anything worthy of praise think about these things this is what he's calling us to reflect attentively on to constantly be uh, playing over the hard drive of our mind or the the movie screen of our mind it's constantly reflecting on these particular things what are they number one it's truth Number one, it's truth. There's one writer says that anxiety comes when false ideas and unreal circumstances occupy the mind instead of truth. How many times have you and I got all been out of shape over what we perceive to be said or done that actually never happened? But when you bring truth to the situation, that's when, when you begin to reflect on the truth and think on the truth, that's when peace starts to overwhelm your soul. And what's interesting is, is that we don't just reflect on a body of truth, we reflect on the object of truth, which is Jesus. And he even said in the Gospel of John, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And so we reflect not on a body of truth, but we reflect on the physical body of truth, Jesus Christ, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And so we get our minds off of all the tension that we're seeing, all the things that are causing us to get bent out of shape, and we get them singularly focused on the object of our affection, our adoration, and our worship. We get them locked in, tractor radar beam on Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and focus on truth. 
He calls, calls us to focus on what he says. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true and whatever is honorable. That phrase, honorable, that word honorable actually means holy. To think on the things that are holy, that are worthy of our honor, worthy of our worship. When we reflect on the things that get our, we, we need to begin to reflect on the things that get our minds above the filth above the scum, above the corrosion of our culture and get our minds focused on the things that are holy and that are honorable. And I know that sounds kind of churchy, but I don't know if you know where you came today. Do you know where you're at? We're not at Rotary. We're at a church. So there are things at a church that are churchy man i know that blew you away isn't that crazy and so what god's calling the church to think on to navigate through difficult circumstances are churchy things so that you can be holy and acceptable in his sight and he calls us to think about things that are honorable, that lift our eyes up above the scandal of this world. Where do you go? Right here. I don't know where to start. Pick one. All of them are great. He moves on and he says, think on the things that are right. He actually uses the word just, but it means right. It means fair or righteous. It's right thought shaped by the word of God that begins to steer us away from argument, steer us away from selfish behavior with our family and our friends and uh, people that we come into contact with. And it leads us to serve instead of sever. That's what happened between Yodi and Syntyche. They were severing instead of serving. They were, hey, you wronged me, I'm wronging you. Listen, it's like you poke mama bear, then you're gonna get mama bear, right? Wrong attitude. Sorry, it is. We don't come to sever, but we come to serve one another and serve humanity and serve our community. And so we think on the things that are right and the things that are just and the things that are fair and righteous. He moves on to say uh, that whatever is pure, I think you probably know what that is. It's the things that lead us, uh, listen, you think on the things that lead you towards Christ, not away from Christ. Most of us have an all-out war going on in our mind. And if we got a handle on this one thing right here, many of us would walk in the peace that all of us desire. We think about the things that lead us to Christ and not away from him. He goes on to say, whatever is lovely. When was the last time you said that word? That's the problem is we don't usually use words like this, but it really means, uh, it's a rare word and it means agreeable and pleasing. That's what it means. So now when you think about that, you're like, oh, that is what lovely means. Lovely does mean agreeable. It does mean pleasing. This is the one for me, it's the first thing that goes out. This is the problem that I have in my house right now is that Aaron is not always the most lovely. I'm not always the most agreeable. I'm just not. Like, I got an opinion about everything, and so does you. So do you. All of us do, right? We have opinions about everything, and <clears throat> the thing is, is that just because you have an opinion doesn't mean everybody needs to know about it. And this is the relational quality that makes relationships work. Loveliness. That's what ushers in peace into our homes. And I'm just airing my dirty laundry. This is the thing I struggle with all the time because I feel like we should hear what Aaron has to say about that. And it's not right. It's not right. And if I want to have peace in my relationship with Joy or in my relationship with my four kids in the context of my home, I probably ought to get on the lovely train a little more and buy a front row seat because that will bring the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. He goes on to say whatever is commendable, and that means worthy of praise, uh, whatever is ex uh, of any excellence, it's, uh, think about what's, ex what's good. He goes on to say what's praiseworthy, something worthy of high commendation. So what's interesting is the very last three, it's, hey, forget about all the things that's causing you that relational strife. Find the thing in Yodia that you can go, that's bomb right there. Call that out. Call that thing out in her, call that thing out in him that you look at them and go, man, that, that is the, literally, that's the thumbprint of God on your life. There's no way that that is God using you. 
and you throw those accolades on them. Could you imagine what our houses would look like if we started finding all the things that are worthy of praise, all the things that are excellent, all the things that are commendable, and literally putting all of those things on Front Street, what kind of spirit would happen in our home and in our place of business? Think about this. What would happen in our church if all that we put on Front Street were what was commendable, what was worthy of praise, and what was worthy of that kind of affection? You see, for many of us, probably what we struggle with in church life is probably the loveliness. Probably struggle with that and, 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 and landing on not being that. And what we want and what I want for us to be is a people that when people walk in, they can't put their finger on what it is, but what we know it is, it's loveliness. We've got our minds set on these things. We're reflecting attentively on these things. And what's powerful about this, y'all, is that even in the midst of stressful, anxious moments in our lives with our family and our friends, our neighbors and our coworkers, all of those types of things, when we begin to reflect on what is true, holy, right, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and praiseworthy, uh, with whom we're having that kind of fracture in that moment, when we begin to do those things, something incredible happens. We receive abundantly the peace of God. When you land those three points and you begin to churn that out and work that thing out, you begin to receive the peace of God. Paul says in Colossians in chapter 3, verse 15, he tells us that the peace of Christ will rule in your hearts. That's what we receive. When we land these three points hardcore and we're committed to them and we're going to uh, rejoice, request, and reflect, then we will receive the peace of God. It will rule in our hearts. And we will not be shaken. Now what's awesome about this is that we receive specific peace. Two kinds of peace. We receive a protecting peace. This is powerful, guys. Look at verse 7. I skipped this verse on purpose. I don't know if you caught it. uh, But if you had your Bible open, you probably saw it. Verse 7 says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So you and I will receive the peace of God and it's a protecting peace. It's the idea of a post-wartime peace. Over the break, uh, Christmas break, uh, you know, this last week, Joy and I were watching a a World War II movie and we were just blown away again. We'd seen the movie before, uh, but blown away at the fallout and the devastation of Pearl Harbor. I mean, unbelievable and then the war that ensued as America got involved for the next, what, five or so years after that, and the thousands of lives that were lost on both sides, Americans and other people in the Allied forces. I mean, it's unbelievable how many people lost their lives. But the moment that Hitler was defeated and their regime was broken down, what happened? all over the world. That's called peace. And what you receive from God by his supernatural power is that when the war of your circumstances are battling out, when you walk through this paradigm that we've walked through this morning, you receive a protecting peace of God that calls you into that moment of God is my shield God is my defender look at the language he uses he says that he will guard your hearts guarding your hearts against what bitterness envy selfishness that peace will guard that that peace will guard your mind and the, the, the anxious thoughts that you begin to fill your mind and begin to direct your steps. The peace of God protects you from your mind and from your heart. Many of us like to say things like, I just followed my heart in that decision. And I would just urge you to stop saying that. Because the scripture tells us that above all things, the heart of man is deceitful. Your heart is deceitful. That's why it needs to be saved by the power of God. So you follow God 
and let his peace wash over you and let it guard your heart and guard your mind. I love what Isaiah 26, 3 says, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Isn't that good? There's a protecting peace that you receive, but also there's a personal peace. Yes, he protects your heart and he protects your mind, but there is a personal element to this. In verse nine, the scripture says, what you have learned, these two ladies, but also this church, and received and heard and seen in me, there it is, practice these things and the peace of God will be with you. Paul is saying, "Uh, you know me. Like, you know my story. You know where I've been, uh, where I've gone in my life and, and the imprisonment and the beatings and the struggles and the, uh, the flogging and all of this stuff that has happened to me. And you've watched me in that moment not throw in the white towel and, and just, I'm done. I'm done with Christ. I'm done with this whole church thing. I'm done with being obedient because look at what all of that has gotten me in my life. It's landed me in a jail, chained to a, uh, you know, another prisoner. This is not good. You've seen me not give in to that and you've seen me request you've seen me reflect you've seen me receive the peace of God and this is a personal thing in my life and I'm not giving you something that I haven't experienced in my life that's what Paul's saying it's personal and what I stand before you today is an honest man saying I have received the peace of God I've stood before people who've turned their backs on me and who have said horrible things about our family And in the trying of circumstances of life, when people were beating me down and walking through difficult situations in our life, I literally didn't receive peace from people on the horizontal level. I received peace from a vertical level because God's peace washed over me and in the midst of the firing squad of life, I was fine. Because God was sovereign, God was on his throne, and his peace overwhelmed my heart. So I stand before you as a man like Paul stood before the church of Philippi and saying, listen, this peace is real. And it is tangible. It's like a new jacket. It's like a new pair of clothes. You put that thing on and you feel like a million bucks when you've got the peace of God. Because why? It surpasses everything. So I don't know what we'll walk through in 2019. I have no clue. I have no clue what we will face as a church I don't know what you will walk through personally, but what I do know is that there will be things that will steal our attention, that will hijack our affection, and that will move us not, hear me, not drastically, but one degree at a time away from Christ. And before we know it, we might be miles apart from where he wants us to be. And we find ourselves in the most trying of circumstances. And in the midst of that circumstance, what God wants you and me to know is that he's right there with you. And that you can have peace. You can have peace in 2019. You can have peace right now if you're walking through a difficult situation. Not by tightening your shoes tighter, cinching your belt tighter, and getting after it. Because you can't, I can't, we can't grind enough to get the kind of peace That surpasses all understanding. We only get that from God. Join me as we pray. Father, we receive your peace today. And God, today we understand what you've called us to and we receive it. Your word is clear and it's active and it's alive. And what we now know is that you've called me to deliver the word and the word is like a seed that's planted into the heart of men. And then God, you will water this and that you will cause this to mature you will cause this to grow. Still praying today, every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. How many of you would just say, hey, Aaron, I I didn't know that I was coming here today to hear this, but I I need, I'm, I'm going through a circumstance today. I'm about to face something I'm not really ready for, and I need the peace of God in my life. How many of you would just say that I wanna pray for you? You got something specific on your heart. Raise your hand, I wanna see you. Nobody's looking around, just me. Hands up all over the place. Father God, thank you for this moment of surrender. God, we give this situation to you. Would you just say that in your heart right now, whatever it is? Yes, God, that situation, that relationship, that moment, that circumstance. 
God, we will no longer let the enemy allow that thing to steal our joy. You have called us to rejoice always. And God, today by your strength, not our might, but your strength, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we will rejoice that you are sovereign over all things and that you are working a plan and we don't have to understand it all right now. But God, today you are good even when life isn't good. May we reflect on that. May we call out to you as the shield and defender of our faith, the fortress that we hide in. God, may we run to the word of God, your word for your people. May we claim the, the principles and the promises of your word into our hearts and in our lives. God, we thank you for this time. Still praying today, every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. Thank you for your honesty. Today, what we want to do is reflect on the faithfulness of God in our lives through this last year, but then also look forward to all that God is going to do in our lives personally, but in our church as well. And we're going to choose to respond today to this message through celebrating communion. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ today, this is your moment where you can celebrate this little cup of juice that represents the shed blood of Christ and this little unleavened piece of bread that is a, refle- a, a metaphor, a picture of the body of Christ that was broken for your sin and mine. If you have never put your faith and trust in Christ, we'd ask for you just to kind of sit back and observe today. And if you'd like to put your faith and trust in Christ, all you have to do is admit that you're a sinner, believe that Jesus can be your Savior, and He is, and confess Him right now in your heart as Lord. And if you do that, then you're a follower of Christ. And you can participate today. But what we're going to do today is we're going to celebrate this communion as a family. And what I want you to do is I want you to come up here after I say amen and you can, there's bread and there's juice on either side of this table. And you just grab that, take it back to your seat, maybe pray with the group of people you came with today, your family, do communion together. And you have this whole song to respond and to communion and to reflect on what Christ did for you and what he did for your family and what he's going to do this year through you. All I ask is that you enter into this moment with a sense of humility and a repentant heart and treat it as a holy moment where you can meet God in a new and fresh way. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. We want to choose today in this moment to reflect on what your son did for us on the cross. We thank you that we can now, by your son, through the power of the spirit, approach you in worship. God, we reflect on you today. In Christ's name, amen.